Right, well, thank you so much for the introduction, Mingyu, and it's really a, a great pleasure to be here to tell you uh, some of the things that I really love and enjoy about ion traps, and really to, to see all of the physics and all of the science that underlies some of the great results that you kind of hear and, and you read about in journals, and you go to conferences and see. Um, but a lot of what people don't talk about is how all of the work really gets done at its core level. And so what I'm thinking about here is for a two lecture sequence on ion traps, um, that talk about quantum simulation. Uh, I'm going to kind of take it as a given that you're all at a quantum simulation workshop, that maybe I don't have to motivate all that hard, um, that quantum simulation is interesting and solve these very difficult problems. And, and ion traps in particular, you know, they have long coherence times and they have good gate fidelities and good state prep and readout, all that kind of stuff. Um, I want to say these are all properties of the qubit itself. How do we actually get access to that qubit? How do we trap? How do we control that qubit? And how do we use those qubits and wire them up to make them do something quantum simulation-y? Okay, and, and that's really going to be the focus to really understand how we can control and manipulate these things at a real core level, right? So I'm not going to be discussing kind of all of the flashy results that happen. I think we'll save that for the regular quantum simulation conference and everything else. But this is really a, a two-lecture sequence on what makes ions go at all. All right, and so you know, just like uh, just like with Beach's great talk, you know, I'm very happy to take questions in the middle. So if something doesn't make sense, please stop me, interrupt, and we'll go wherever the discussion goes. And you know, I've prepared these two lectures, but you know, we'll we'll just talk about what you're interested in. So the overall plan, though, that I have in mind is to say, you know, there's two lectures. Lecture one is going to be about ion coulomb crystals. Okay, the ions themselves, as we trap and cool them inside of some sort of a, a potential. Um, so it's going to be talking about how do we find ions, what are their geometric arrangements, um, you know, how do they interact with each other, with Coulomb forces, all in the same trap. Uh, in some sense, this whole first lecture is all going to be about the classical stuff involved with ion traps. Okay, and so once we understand the classical stuff, then we can build the quantum stuff on top of it. Um, and then that's going to be the focus of lecture two. How do we take all of these interactions between these Coulomb, these charged things, and then turn that into something for quantum simulation? Okay, and so once we have that, then we have everything that's useful for simulations of chemistry, for materials, for whatever really write a Hamiltonian to describe. All right, sound good? Okay, so here we go. Um, to begin, let me start with kind of a picture of what I might call a standard ion trap, okay? And this is an ion trap that uses only electric fields to do its confinement. Uh, and this gets the name of a Paul trap. Okay, and so here is the way that we design a Paul trap in kind of a standard configuration. I'm gonna draw this as four very long rods. Okay, something like this. And then I'm gonna put two needles kind of face the center, and then ions are trapped at the center of this thing, okay? So there's many, many, many different configurations of a fall trap, maybe for specificity. Let me give you a couple of axes. So X, Y, and Z axes. And we have many, many different configurations of fall traps. Let me start with that. You have traps like I've drawn, you have blade traps, you have surface traps. Um, but all of them are roughly following the same kind of principle, which is we want to build some sort of an electric cage around the ions. Okay, so you try to do this. Um, the goal is to confine charged particles inside of this electric field cage, and immediately you run into a difficulty. Okay, the first difficulty if you try to do this is that in free space, Laplace's equation tells you that del squared V is equal to zero. Okay, so V is your electric potential. You take del squared V, which is really saying, take the curvature in the X direction plus the curvature in the Y plus the curvature in the Z, and the sum of all three of those numbers has to equal zero. And for a trap, you want the curvature to be positive. Okay, you want your particle to live in a minimum. And all of a sudden, you have an impossibility because if I'm gonna add a positive number to a positive number to a positive number, I can't get zero. Right? So one of those numbers has to be negative. And what that tells you is that for an electrostatic field in free space, it's impossible to trap a particle. Okay. If that was the end of the story, then kind of we'd be done, right? But it's not the end of the story. There's a way around this restriction from Laplace's equation. And that's to notice that this only holds for stationary fields. And we can circumvent by using an RF 
field. Okay, if we make the electric field in this ion trap time dependent, then we're no longer restricted by Laplace's equation. And the way that we make it time dependent is to come back over to this ion trap. I didn't tell you what voltages we put on. Okay, and so the way that I'm going to do it is I'm going to grab two opposite corners and put on an RF voltage. I'm going to take the other two, ground them, and then on these needles, I can put a DC voltage. All right, so this is an electro, this is an electric field cage where the electric fields are oscillating in time. And one of the real surprising things is that this dynamical electric field can stably trap particles forever. Okay, so there have been ion traps where particle trapping has lasted for months and beyond. Okay, so these are not kind of temporary you know, unstable kind of solutions where the slightest perturbation makes everything fall apart. These are long-term stable solutions um, that can really work. And if I can bring down the screen just by a little bit here. All right, so let's see, I know the controls are here. And so we're gonna kind of swap screen for whiteboard every so often. Yeah, so if we bring down the screen, uh, I've got this great video that can even show classically how a dynamic thing can stabilize. Let's see if we can get this to work here. Okay, so what I'm showing in this video is we have a saddle potential. You can look at this as being confining in one direction and anti-confining in the other, all right? So this is what exactly a stationary electric field would do to your trapped ion. Try as you might, you can try to balance the trapped ion right at the center, but any little perturbation is going to destroy it. All right, so now we have this saddle confining and anti-confining and we start to rotate it. Okay, so we make this saddle dynamic in time. And when we make this thing dynamic, come back with our ball, we put it in this potential, and now all of a sudden, the ball is stabilized. Okay, so forever, you know, unless you go over and whack it or something, you know, that, that ball is gonna be trapped in this potential, right? And this is confining and anti-confining directions, but we're rotating them faster than the ball can find the exit. And this leads to a long-term equilibrium. Right, so it's kind of a remarkable thing. I made a little 3D printed version of this for people who come to my lab and have lab tours. Um, but you know, here's the video of how something like this works and it works exactly uh, the same way in the ion trap system as well. All right, is that clear enough so far? Questions? You talk about the time scale rotation. Yes. What's the physical model? Can you talk about how that has to do with, you know, maybe the mass of the wall or something like that? Yeah, so, so the question is about the time scale of rotation. Uh, and I think I've been admonished to make people use the cube wherever that is. But uh, so the, the question is about the time scale of rotation. Uh, the real answer to the math underlying this is that the solutions to this are known as the solutions to the Matthew equation. This is a differential equation studied in the mid 1800s. And there are a whole bunch of known stability regions for stable bounded solutions to the Matthew equation that indeed depend on things like what is the charge of the ion? What's the mass of the ion? How fast do you rotate? You know, all of those kind of things kind of go into this soup and tell you, you know, in some dimensionless space, what is, you know, what are the parameters that give you stability or not? And so based on knowing the charge or the mass of the ion, then you can kind of calculate what is the total range of stability for how fast you have to rotate. All right, fantastic. Okay, so we're using this dynamic electric field to do the stabilization. And so let me write down, what is this VRF that's getting applied here? So VRF, I'm gonna write this as one half times V zero cosine of capital omega T times time times one plus X squared plus Y squared over capital R squared. Okay, and so this capital R, this is the distance to the electrode. Okay, so this is an overall length scale that measures how far away is this ion from the electrode. This one plus X squared plus Y squared over R squared, that's the geometric stuff that makes a quadrupole kind of potential. And then this cosine of capital omega T times time, that's the oscillating RF field. Okay, so here the oscillation is at, sometimes we call it the trap frequency, capital omega subtrap. Okay, so this is a potential. Oh, excuse me, I've already got something wrong. <laughs> Sorry about that. 
x squared minus y squared. Okay, this is confining in x, anti-confining in y, and then half a period later, this cosine switches it. Okay, so we start with that. And if you think back to the video, you know, we had this rotating saddle, but we didn't talk about the vertical direction in the video, right? In the vertical direction in the video, we kind of got confinement for free because that experiment was done on Earth. And on Earth, we have gravity, and gravity provided the confinement in the z direction. When it comes to particles here, if I look at the z direction, the particles, okay, I still need confinement along that direction. And so for confinement along the z direction, I put on this potential v sub dc, and that's a voltage u0 times z squared minus one half x squared plus y squared, all divided by z0 squared. Okay, and so here too, z0 is this length between the needle and the ion. We have potential that is confining in z, but anti-confining in x and y, right? And that's okay because this one here is confining in x and y when you average over all of this rotation. Okay, so we've got these potentials. This is what the time dependent and the stationary potentials look like. And effectively, the trapped ions are now moving in this time dynamic set of potentials. And effectively, what the ion sees is a time averaged three dimensional trap. Okay, and it has to be that case that it sees a time averaged three dimensional trap because it doesn't escape. It stays exactly where you put it to begin with, which means that the particle is trapped. And there's really two different types of motion that, you know, if you were really eagle eyed when it came to that video, uh, that you can pull out. And I want to discuss the two different types of motion uh, that ions undergo inside of these potentials. Uh, but before I get to that, are there questions about anything that I have on board right now? All right. So let me talk about these particle motions. All right, so the first motion that I want to talk about is a slow harmonic motion. And sometimes this is called the secular motion. Okay, and this is really the idea that this particle is trapped in a three dimensional potential. And so if you're in a, for instance, a three dimensional harmonic oscillator, then you'd expect that you have an oscillation frequency along the x direction and the y direction and the z direction. Okay. And in fact, by going through and solving this Matthew equation that gives you the charge and the mass and the rotation speed and all this kind of stuff, you can derive that the slow harmonic motion really is like a 3D harmonic oscillator where the frequencies omega. This is the slow harmonic oscillator frequency in the x and the y directions. It's equal to the square root of charge divided by mass times charge times brf squared over 2 times the mass times capital R to the fourth times omega trap squared minus u0 or z0 squared. So these are two of the frequencies, the two radial frequencies where we have this rotating saddle. And then along this long axis of the trap, the z direction, the frequency here is square root of two times the charge times u0 divided by mass times z0 squared. All right. So this works for an ion with mass m and charge q. And I'll just point out one thing here, which is that this radial frequency, the x and y direction, it involves something minus something else, okay? So this is the RF voltage. This is the scale of the DC voltage that we're pushing on with these needles here in the z direction. And if this voltage in the z direction gets too large, then this whole thing underneath the square root becomes imaginary. And then all of a sudden you don't have a trap. You've crossed some stability region, so you have to do 
be aware of the RF and DC voltages that you're putting on to make sure that you have good track. So uh, for Omega XY, uh, inside the brackets, the first term has VF, VRF squared. The second term is V zero. So are they dimensionally uh, the same? Sorry, could you say that again? Oh, I was saying that uh, for some of the XY, uh, inside the parenthesis, the first term is V power squared, right? Mm -hmm. And the second term has just V zero. So I was just wondering if they have the matching diamond bits. Ooh, matching units. Yeah. yeah, let me look at this. <laughs> when anybody did, when I, I just started to uh, immediately uh, figure that out. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, I see your point. Uh, I'm gonna have to go back and check. I don't remember off the top of my head. I, just, I think I've got it right, but uh, okay. yeah, let me let me follow up on that. Thanks. All right, fantastic. Okay, so we've got these three dimensional harmonic oscillators. We oscillate in the x and y direction. We oscillate in the z direction. Okay, so this is the first motion that I wanted to talk about. The second motion. is fast driven motion at capital omega trap, okay? And this is with amplitude little r times q times v r f divided by mass capital R squared omega trap squared. Okay, and this fast driven motion gets the name of micro motion. Okay, and now this micro motion, you know, again, it was really there in the video if you were kind of looking for it. What this micro motion is telling you is that if the ion is in this trap, it has this slow kind of rocking back and forth in three dimensions. That's the harmonic oscillator part. But also this time, this very fast, uh, you know, time changing electric field, it kicks this ion around. Okay, and so in particular, this ion gets this kicking around at the frequency with which you're driving the voltages, and the amplitude of that kicking is proportional to this coordinate little r, which is your radial distance from the center of the track. Okay, so if I asked how far away from the central axis am I? That would be some coordinate r. Okay, so if I looked at a 2D plane or something that is perpendicular here, and I asked how far off the axis radially am I? That coordinate r times a bunch of that stuff, those constants tell you the amplitude of the driven micromotion here. Okay, and this is important because one of the things that a lot of people who trap ions want to do is avoid micromotion, right? Avoiding, avoiding driven motion like this can be really important if you're trying to build an atomic clock or something out of trapped ions and you want stability at the 10 to the minus 18 level and you don't want Doppler shifts or any kind of other motion to get into the problem and you don't want to worry about that. There's kind of a solution built in here. Make sure that your ion has zero distance away from that central axis of the trap and you can avoid micromotion. Right, and so for that reason, um, I'd say that far and away the most common way of trapping ions, especially if you want to trap multiple ions, is to arrange those multiple ions so that they all lie in a one dimensional chain along the central axis of the trap. Okay, let me pause there for questions or comments on that. Can you? Service yeah, so the, right. so the question is for a surface trap. If I were to make a kind of cross-sectional view of a surface trap, um, generally you have kind of DC electrodes and maybe RF, like that and that, and then maybe ground in the center or maybe a, a gap or something like that. And then here too, if you kind of look at what the potential looks like, there is this uh, sort of micromotion minimum at a certain distance away from the surface of the trap. And if you, again, 
stick, you know, imagine that this is extruded out of the board a long distance. If you stick along this central line where kind of you have field cancellation right at the center, then that too is a micro motion free position of the trap. Okay, so surface traps have been very successful. Um, and really it says, what is the symmetry axis where you have no micro motion, put your ions there. All right, other questions? Okay, we've got a, a few, I see you first. Configurations? So I think the question was, does that rule out 2D configurations? Uh, the answer is no, not at all. Uh, I'll talk about them in just a minute. It's a time dependent opportunity. So when you talk about energy, yeah, that's right. So, so already at this point in, in kind of our analysis of the ions, we have abstracted away from the time dependent potential um, to say that the slow harmonic motion is already the, you know, you called it the flow K, which is exactly the right word, the flow K bounded solution um, to say, you know, we call it the pseudo potential. On average, does the ions. I guess. Okay. All right, so with this, then, you know, when we start talking about multiple ions, then I'm going to just kind of erase this in the middle here and start to think about what it is that we can, uh, what it is that we can, we can do. So let's say I wanted to trap multiple ions, and let's suppose that I wanted to avoid micromotion entirely. The way to do that would be to load multiple ions into a one-dimensional chain so that they all lay um, along the central axis of this trap. Okay. The way to do that from a pragmatic point of view is I have to make sure that the potential along this Z direction is relatively weak compared to the potential along the X and the Y direction. All right. And the reason here is that all of these particles, they're charged. And because of Coulomb repulsion, they all want to get as far away from each other as they can. Right. In fact, if there were no trap, then they would all just, you know, explode out to infinity. Right, so in order to confine them at all, we have this trap that's pushing back against the Coulomb force. And we want to make sure that the pushing in this direction is relatively weak compared to the other directions, so that when they get as far apart from each other as they can, the direction that they squeeze out in is along that central axis. Okay, and so these are the equilibrium positions of the ions, they self assemble. And they find their equilibrium positions by saying, what is the balance of forces between the trapping potential, which holds them in, and the Coulomb repulsion, which is trying to push them out, okay? Wherever they arrange in space so that the sum of the forces is equal to zero, then that is the equilibrium configuration, okay? And I have a few slides that I can show on this as well. So let me bring down the screen. All right, so what I have here is just kind of a cartoon picture of the trap that I've drawn on the board, a whole bunch of ions in one dimension, and then you should imagine these ions are sitting is in some one, you know, kind of global harmonic potential along the Z direction here. Okay, and so this is the PowerPoint drawing of it. Uh, this is what they really look like. So on the left is a camera image of, I think, 13 trapped ions all in a one-dimensional line. Uh, on the right is kind of a simulation of, of where you expect the ion positions to be just based on this balance of forces. Okay, so this is all very classical and very um, sort of straightforward to, to calculate. Now, we had a great question before is, you know, is that the only geometry we can do with trapped ions? And the answer is no. By playing around with the different ratios of X and Y and Z frequencies, potentials, and how hard we squeeze in all of those different directions, the ion Coulomb crystal will follow. So for instance, if we now go back to our trap and then we squeeze harder on these needles, okay, we turn up the voltage on those needles, which really means we're turning up the potential, um, then eventually the ions are going to buckle into what we call a zigzag configuration, uh, or sometimes uh, people call it a lateral 2D crystal. And the idea here is that it's now energetically favorable for these ions to kind of start moving into the vertical direction to minimize their energy rather than staying in this one-dimensional potential. Okay, and so here I have 
I'm showing that as we're kind of squeezing harder and harder to the right, then the, that same ion crystal buckles and we get this kind of zigzag configuration. And also depending on how you look at it, this is also a self-assembled two-dimensional array uh, that is a triangular lattice. Okay, and so for instance, uh, very recently in the trapped ion field, uh, there have been experiments, quantum simulations performed with, I think something like three to 500 uh, trapped ions. And this is the configuration that they use for them, right? So this is out of the main blonde group this year. Uh, this is a self-assembled triangular lattice of about several hundred ions. And, and this is this zigzag or lateral 2D configuration. Okay, you load a whole bunch of them in, you squeeze the end caps by a little bit, and then you get this kind of cigar shaped thing uh, with triangular lattice structure. Right, please. Yeah, so we'll, you know, a lot of people keep asking about the micro motion, which is great. And so maybe I'll stop like holding it to the end. Um, I'll say that the things to worry about when it comes to micro motion are is there going to be significant heating? And is there going to be um, a problem with imaging? Okay, and so I'll talk about both of those things, but you can always, in at least these configurations, pick it so that the direction that you're interested in for quantum simulation is not subject to micromotion heating. Um, it may be subject to micromotion amplitude, but that's less of a concern so long as that amplitude is small compared to the inter ion spacing, meaning that you can optically resolve and, and detect and, and address every ion while, while keeping it away from its neighbors. And you can even kind of see from these pictures here, the answer is yes, if you look really, really closely, as you get further and further and further away from this central axis, you notice how the ions start to look a little bit elliptical. I don't know if your eyes are good enough to see that, but it's there. And that is an effect of the micromotion. Okay, so that amplitude is still small compared to the spacing, so they're still okay here with 500 hertz. It's like in a plane, Desire. Yes, and these are in a two-dimensional plane. And so they, they want to play, it's a plane like one of rotating. And so in this case, the, the y-axis is out of the board. The y-axis is very tightly confining, so it is energetically disfavorable for this thing to rotate. Oh, I, see. I thought there was like a symmetry between x and y. So depending on how you build your trap, you can break that symmetry. And in this case, you purposefully want to break that symmetry so that you do not have those rotations. Excellent. Okay, one more question. Same question. All right, so this also is not yet the end of the story. All right, so we can continue pushing. All right, so we were at two dimensional, you know, zigzag kind of thing. We can continue pushing inwards uh, with, those, with those potentials. And here, this one kind of looks like a mess, um, which is almost the entire reason that I keep showing these simulations on the right to say that that mess is perfectly predictable. And what happens is what it is that we see. Um, it's hard to see in a two dimensional plane, but what you're looking at is almost this three dimensional helical structure. Okay, so with 13 ions and these kind of potentials, how the ions get as far away from each other and minimize their energy is not necessarily obvious. Um, but in three dimensions, there is such a configuration. It's predictable, and that's what we see, because that's what the ions do. The final uh, geometric phase that I'll talk about uh, is what happens when you kind of push ultimately to the limit. You squeeze as hard as you can in this trap. The final uh, configuration that these crystals go through is uh, what we call a radial 2D crystal. And this is where all of the ions now, we have squished them into a single plane. And if you were to look at this plane perpendicularly, this is a plane, again, where we have a self-assembled triangular lattice of ions. Okay, so we can go through all of these different configurational uh, phases of trapped ion crystals just based on how we're squeezing the voltages. Cube, we must have the cube. So, so in the pictures G, H, and I, mm -hmm. are we imagining that this is static or is it rotating along? Yeah, so same aspect? here. It's, it's kind of hard to tell from the pictures, but the uh, let me point over here. The symmetry between this direction and this direction are ever so slightly broken. You know, we've done this by squeezing the potential just by a little bit. And so, in fact, there is a low energy configuration of this crystal that prevents it from rotating. If they were exactly equal frequencies, then it would cost no energy for this whole thing to rotate. And we don't want that. Okay. Uh, so it's concerning the experimental facts. So can I actually clarify what is the actual dimension, like the two unreal electrodes, they are separating apart. I think it shows like for a couple of like 100 microns, I would guess. 
Uh, the, the separation here between ions is of order five. Yeah, mm -hmm. electrodes are like, and, and how big are the electrodes? The trap we used here, the distance to the electrodes is about one millimeter. One millimeter. So, uh, yes, I'm just wondering, like, how large the electrode field you actually you actually actually go through to actually go from one D channel to this field? Because it looks like you are pretty much basically scraping things together. Do you have to go to our high Yeah. So, so in terms of just raw experimental numbers, you know, with that kind of trap to go from that trapping potential to down there. We increase the DC confinement by by going from something like a little less than a volt, a few tenths of a volt, all the way up to about 60 or 70 volts in this last example. Okay. Pretty moderate. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you bring the electrodes in closer, then you don't have to put as much voltage on. Uh, does the trap in each of these directions have to be harmonic or quadratic? Uh, it does not have to be quadratic in each of these directions. It, in this case, it turns out to be quadratic just because the electrodes are so far away and you're sort of near the bottom of this electric potential minimum and, and near the bottom of any minimum that's quadratic. Thanks. Right. Okay. So now I want to get into a case where we start coupling these ions together. So I've talked about the Coulomb interaction, right? So we know that these ions are aware of each other. Okay. Move the screen up just a little bit more, please. Perfect, thanks. Yeah, so we know that these ions are aware of each other in the sense that their equilibrium, uh, their equilibrium confinement is dictated by the Coulomb interaction and the Coulomb repulsion between them. And because you have a whole bunch of these things that are coupled through the Coulomb interaction, this looks like a classic, a classical coupled oscillator problem, right? And so if I have n ions in my trap, then in principle, I have three n normal modes of motion, right? So if you think back to, you know, unrepress these memories of, of, you know, undergraduate physics where you have balls and springs and all these things coupled to everything else, and you go ahead and you push on one of these balls with the springs and everything else starts oscillating, that's really what we have to deal with when it comes to trapped ions here. And so if you have three directions and n ions, then you have three times n possible vibrations that you have to consider. Okay, so we're going to simplify that to start. Pretty much all ion trappers do. We consider exciting n modes along a single direction. Okay, so I've mentioned the x and the y and the z directions inside of our trap. I'm going to pick just one of those directions and consider the n vibrational modes. Okay, so let me say that the n modes in a direction have their own uh, let me call it vibrational frequency. and set of amplitudes. All right, let me show you what I mean. So let's say that I have two ions. We'll start real simple, okay? And if it helps you in your mind to think of these two ions as being kind of coupled by a spring or something like that, then I'm okay with that. All right, so let's say I have two ions here, and I think what are the normal modes of motion for these two ions, let's say along the uh, horizontal direction? Well, one mode of motion, we sometimes call it the center of mass motion, is just both of them oscillate together. Okay, they both go to the right, they both go to the left. You know, they don't change their separation. The other normal mode of motion, sometimes people call this the tilt mode, where one of them moves to the right and the other one moves to the left. Okay, it's the one where if you have two balls coupled by a spring, it's the one where they just kind of oscillate out of phase with each other. And no matter what the oscillation between two things coupled by a spring, uh, you can always decompose it into some amount of this motion plus some amount of that motion, right? So that's all we're doing when we talk about normal modes. Okay, so now you can kind of imagine that, you know, step one is do it for two, and then kind of what I'm going to show you here is, is how to draw the rest of the hour, right? We have to figure out 
if I have the entire set of normal modes, I have the entire set of Coulomb crystals, how do we calculate all of the different vibrational frequencies and vibrational patterns? So I'm gonna get a little mathy, which is not in my wheelhouse an experimentalist, but I think that it's worth it in this case. Um, so the way that you do it is you start with all of your equilibrium positions that we've calculated for those trapped ions. You pick your direction and you expand those equilibrium positions to second order. Um, you expand the potential to second order around the equilibrium positions. Okay, so let me say that the potential, for instance, in the X direction is equal to one half N omega Z squared times the sum over indices I and A going from one to capital N of a number A sub IJ, so this is a matrix element, times psi I, psi J. And these psi's are displacements from equilibrium. All right. So if we just take a step back here for a second, we have this potential. The potential is a trapping potential plus the Coulomb potential from everybody in the trap. I pick on two of my ions. I move this one over here and that one over here. I've displaced from, from equilibrium. And now I wanna know how much energy did that cost? Okay, the amount of energy is one half M omega Z squared times the displacement times a number which captures the Coulomb interaction between I and J. Right, and so that matrix element AIJ is equal to omega x over omega z quantity squared minus the sum on P not equal to I of one over xi minus xp cubed when I is equal to J, and it's equal to one over the magnitude of xi minus xj cubed when I is not J. All right, math off. All right, so really what this is saying is that you have this one over distance cubed interaction between ions I and J. When you move them a little bit off the axis, you can build this whole matrix AIJ, and then that gives you all of the matrix elements for how much energy does it cost if I pick on any ion or any other ion, any pair of ions and displace them. Okay. So that's pretty neat, but what do we do? The whole key here is that the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix are entirely what dictate the normal mode frequencies and the oscillation patterns that you get. All right, so really what I'm trying to do here is to systematically build what are all of the vibrational modes we need for trapped ions. Okay, these vibrational modes, modes eventually are gonna be the thing that allow us to spread quantum information from one ion to another ion. And so we really have to understand how they work at a very fundamental Okay, So we have this matrix that describes what all of these Coulomb interactions look like. And what I've just said is that taking the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of that matrix give you the normal mode amplitude and frequencies. All right, so to be formal here, I can write this matrix, capital A is equal to a matrix B, Okay, so this is a matrix of eigenvectors B sub K for each mode K. All right, so if I have N ions, then I have N normal mode eigenvectors. Okay, so this is an N by N matrix times capital lambda. This is a diagonal matrix with eigenvalues, capital lambda sub K, and then the inverse of that B matrix. All right, so if I take the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this A matrix, then I immediately get the matrix of uh, the normal modes. And then this lambda here, uh, the eigenvalues are related to the frequencies by saying that the mode frequency is omega k is equal to the trapped frequency omega z 
times the square root of lambda k. All right. So you start with the same matrix, you calculate all of the elements, you diagonalize it, and immediately you have the normal mode eigenvectors and frequencies. Yeah, so here this is the um, expanding the potential second order around the equilibrium positions. Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, okay. Yep. Yeah. These displacements are in the p direction, right? Displacements here are in the x direction, for instance. The charge and all of that kind of ion stuff is hidden away inside of what that trap frequency is. You change Q, you change the ion mass, all of that, the trap frequency for a given set of potentials will change also. Um, and I also, I also should say, in this A matrix, these, uh, maybe I'll just write it down, these are unitless positions, which is a little bit of a weird thing, but it's a combination of constants like length and charge and mass and all of that kind of stuff to make positions unitless. Right. So I think that's uh, the map behind it, but taking a look at um, pictures is always a little bit more interesting. So let me bring down that screen again. All right, so what I'm plotting here on the left are what the normal mode amplitudes look like if I have a harmonic one-dimensional potential, right? So on the top, that's my center of mass mode. It's the highest frequency mode. And in that case, all of the ions are moving up and down together exactly in the same way, okay? Center of mass mode means they're all the same. This next one down, it's known as the tilt mode, okay? So this is just like in two ions where we have one ion went one way and the other ion went the other way. Here, the left ions are moving up and the right ions are moving down, okay? But each with their own amplitude. And then you can kind of keep going down and down and down in frequency. And then you get these totally different patterns that come up and eventually you land in this zigzag mode where it's hard to see it on the ends, but even more towards the center, it becomes easier to see where one ion goes up, its neighbor goes down, its next neighbor goes up, the next one goes down. Uh, and that's about as zigzaggy of a mode as you get. All right, so this all comes from diagonalizing that A matrix when I've started with a harmonic 1D trap, okay? And so we can label all of these modes based on what it is that they're doing. Oh, we have a question. Yep. So I think uh, what we are doing here is very much similar to what we learned in crystal. Actually, you have some mode propagating here. Right? It sounds like it's just like standing some mode on this crystal. Mm -hmm. So I think, isn't that what you call it? Yeah, so, so you can make total analogies to say that you can think about this as saying, you know, the shapes that you get here are quite reminiscent of standing modes that you get in, you know, inside of some, um, some oscillator or even some string where you kind of clamp the end and drive. Yeah, so there are a lot of nice analogies to be made there. So I guess if you really think of N as springs, then usually the center of mass mode will have lower energy, but here it looks like that, like longer wave length mode has higher energy than me. Yeah, and, and so the question, yeah, the question about is center of mass highest or lowest energy has to do with what direction you look along. And so when you look around along the, these are the so-called transverse modes, they're perpendicular to the long axis of the trap. You know, you should think of that in the way that I've done it here in a one dimensional chain, moving vertically, you know, in the radial direction, that's the very strongly confining direction. So anybody moving off of the axis costs a lot of energy. Everybody moving off of the axis costs the most amount of energy. The situation is reversed in the uh, longitudinal modes, the ones along the direction of the crystal where indeed center of mass mode is the lowest energy. Okay, so this is a harmonic trap. Um, I'll also show you, you can start thinking about things like anharmonic traps, especially surface traps can start making anharmonic potentials. Um, so here you still have a center of mass mode, you still have tilt modes, you still have zigzag modes. Qualitatively, all of the features are the same when you change the shape of the potential. Um, but you can kind of notice that the exact 
envelope function that goes around those qualitative features, they might get modified if you change the shape of the potential. But again, all very calculable, kind of going through that process that I outlined. Just for fun, I'll show one additional picture here, which is uh, what happens when you have a two-dimensional array of, of ions. And so yet again, the highest frequency mode here is a center of mass mode, where you should think of this entire plane as moving towards you and away from you at the same time. Then you have a tilt mode, where you should think of this entire plane as kind of oscillating like this, you know, around some you know, central pivot. And then eventually you get all the way down to the zigzag mode where kind of the inner ion comes out and then the next ring go in and then vice versa. Do you just have a question? There you go. I don't want you to be admonished for that. Um, did it, on this bottom one, does it, do you get like a decay of the, uh, of the, the modes, I was kind of expecting you to have like this kind of zigzag all the way down the chain, but it doesn't happen that way. Yeah, so when you're in a harmonic potential, you know, kind of the reason for that is, you know, in a harmonic potential, the outer ions, you know, they are the ones that are kind of in the, in the largest potential, and they also tend, as a result, to be the ones that are furthest away from the center part of the rest of the ions. Uh, a way to think about it is that in a harmonic trap, let's say that ion all the way on the right, it feels cool on repulsion from everybody pushing it to the right, okay? And so it gets a little bit further away from the center of the chain, whereas the ones in the center, they have roughly balanced forces, cool on repulsion forces to the left and the right. And that means that the ones in the center are, tend to be a little bit more strongly interacting than the ones on the edges. That is not, that is less so the case in an anharmonic potential, which tends to have a much flatter bottom. And when you have a flatter bottom, then you can tend to have, you know, kind of a more of a, an equispaced ion chain, in which case uh, the outer ones don't feel those forces as magnified. Uh, what do you mean by normal forces? For so normal modes are really just saying I have a trap with n things in it, which means that there are n oscillations. And so the particular patterns of those oscillations depend. Um, actually, I'm all done with the, uh, the slide here. So let me go back to that equation. Yeah, so all of the potential stuff says once you have a potential, you have a set of equilibrium positions. Once you know the equilibrium positions, those are what go with, into this matrix here. And so when you diagonalize that matrix with different equilibrium positions, you get different results. Okay, so, so the, the E matrix changes after that, you see that like already. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. So one of the things that we have to make sure that we uh, keep in mind is that we want all of these modes to be cold, okay? These modes are going to be the thing that eventually carry our quantum information. And we want to make sure that these modes are cold, right? So that micromotion has to be considered in all of these cases. And, and the different crystal geometries give you different ideas about micromotion. Right, so we said that when it comes to micromotion, we want to either make sure that all of the ions have zero amplitude away from the central axis, or if they're not zero amplitude away from the central axis, we want to make sure at least that the modes of motion that we are interested in, the n normal modes that we pick, those modes are in a direction that has no micromotion. Okay, and so I have a, a slide that kind of leads us through all of those different things. So let me bring down the screen one more time. And we can kind of consider all of the different possibilities in the crystal configurations that I had showed before. All right. So this top one, we've already discussed 1D chains. They're all already along a no micromotion axis, so we can use any of the modes, no problem. This Zigzag lateral 2D thing. No micromotion left and right, okay? But there will be micromotion up and down, right? Into and out of the board, this is a single 2D plane. So the into and out of the board direction has zero radial distance and therefore zero micromotion amplitude. So what that means is that if we wanna use the modes into and out of the board, they're okay. If we wanna use the modes to the left and the right, they're okay. The only modes we shouldn't use for quantum simulation are the ones that go up and down that picture. 
Let me let that point sink in just for a second and, and invite questions. Is that making sense for that zigzag one? Why two of the directions are okay, but one of them is not? Is it about RG? Yeah, so it involves, if I have a plane this way, I can always use the modes perpendicular because this is zero deviation from the central axis into and out of the plane this way, right? So my promotion in perpendicular direction here is zero. Okay, and as long as there's no micro motion, these modes can stay cold. So into and out of this plane is okay. Left and right is okay because there was never micro motion along that long axis. This way, you have a problem because you have micro motion along this direction and also you have ions at non-zero positions along that direction. Okay, and so, yeah. Yes, still talking about a flow. Yeah, so in, in this case, we don't, we have to kind of assume that we've broken cylindrical symmetry because the trap has uh, chosen a direction to the ions getting further apart vertically. That means that the into and out of the board direction has to be more tightly confined. Okay. So, we can kind of go through all of these and, and figure out, all right, we can always go to one dimension, two dimension, three dimension, unfortunately, you know, that's kind of off limits. Every single mode direction you think about there um, is going to couple the micro motion. Um, but if we go back to radial 2D, again, there is an in-plane direction um, where micro motion is distant, where micro motion um, is present, but perpendicular to the plane, those modes again have no micro motion, you can use those. All right, so 1D and 2D crystals are just fine for quantum simulation. You can avoid the micro motion if you pick the modes correctly. Now, one question. I was just I want to clarify what you mean by the micro motion. So it, it's just a, like a stiff direction, right? Correct. That's yes. what you mean, right? What I, yeah, that's right. So we want to pick a direction where either there is no micro motion, right? Because that would be like a long axis of the trap. Or there is no radial extent of the ions. The ion coordinate in a particular direction, all of them have coordinate zero. If either of those situations is true, then it's a safe set of modes to use. Thank you. All right, so now let me put it all together in the last few minutes here to say, we've done all of this classical stuff to try to learn how do these ions find their equilibrium positions? What are their frequencies going to be? What do the normal modes look like? And I've alluded a couple of times to this idea that the normal modes are going to be the things that allow us to couple quantum information from ion to ion. Okay, so here's how we do it. So let me say how to engineer ion ion couple. Okay, step one, apply a bichromatic, it's a fancy word for two frequency, electric field that takes the form. Electric field is E0, I'll polarize it, let's say in the y hat direction, times the cosine of kx minus omega zero plus or minus mu times T plus phi. Okay, and so I've in introduced a few things here. So this omega zero is our qubit resonance. Okay, so if I have a two level system, the thing that we need for a qubit, and I assume that that qubit is split by frequency omega zero, then that's this omega zero here. And this mu is the detuning from the qubit resonance. All right, so I'm putting on two colors, one where I have the resonance plus mu and resonance minus mu. And so I think sometimes this works a little bit better in, you know, if I kind of draw a picture in frequency space of what I mean here. 
So let's say here is the frequency omega zero. And let's say I shine in a laser at frequency omega zero. And I start in the down state. If I shine on resonant light, then I flip from down to up. Okay, easy enough. That's what happens at omega zero. Now, we also know that there are a whole bunch of other normal modes associated with this picture. Okay, and so that means that if I apply, a, if I think about what would happen if I apply this frequency omega zero and also a little bit extra, then instead of going, let's say, from down to up, I can go from down to up plus. add one phonon of vibration to those normal modes. Okay, so we had all of our different normal modes, center of mass and tilt and all of those, they had their own frequency. So if I apply the qubit resonance, plus a little bit of extra energy, then I can flip the qubit spin, but then also add energy to those normal modes. Oh, <laughs> thank you. What is the qubit on our trapped ions? Yeah, so in this case, um, I'm being totally agnostic. There are hyperfine qubits, for instance. Um, many trapped ion species have a, a hyperfine splitting between, an interaction between the nuclear and the electronic spin. And so this omega zero can be, you know, gigahertz scale. There are also optical qubits where this might be an S state and this might be a P state, a D state rather, um, something that's metastable or relatively long lived. Um, what I'm saying here works the same way for both types of qubits. But in general, each ion represents one qubit. Yes. So in general here, the way I'm thinking about it is that each of these two level systems is inside of a single ion. Great. OK. So if I put on omega 0, I flip the spin. Omega 0 plus a little bit extra in frequency. Then I flip the spin and add a phonon. Similarly, omega 0 minus a little bit of energy, can still flip a spin, but subtract off of them. And so what I'm saying here is put on an electric field with this frequency of omega zero plus or minus mu. Okay, so let me say that mu is that frequency there. And so I'm going to put on an electric field with a frequency two colors there and there. The reason to do that is because this puts on um, a physical Hamiltonian describing laser ion interaction that I'm going to write down as equal to a sum over all ions of the electric dipole interaction, the electric dipole operator. times E0, sigma xi, cosine of k times xi, minus omega naught, plus or minus mu, times t, plus phi. OK, so we have an electric dipole operator. We have an electric field amplitude. And we have the sigma x, which indeed is like the Pauli operator, which is telling us that we're having to do something with the flipping spins here. Okay. Now the magic. And I think the best thing to do is to give a citation for this. So this is all the math and glory detail is worked out in this review article, Review of Modern Physics 93, 025, 001, 2021. The magic is if we take this physical Hamiltonian between ion and laser, we go to a limit where this detuning mu is large compared to those normal mode frequencies, okay, so that we're only kind of virtually exciting those phonons, not resonantly, but far away. Then, in that limit, the Hamiltonian of the ion C is approximately sum over i less than j, jij, sigma xi, sigma xj. Okay, so this is an Ising type Hamiltonian where the coupling between ions I and J is equal to capital omega squared 
So this is the Rabi frequency, capital R, which is the recoil frequency of the atom, times the sum over all of the normal modes, from k equals 1 to n, of b sub i k, b sub j k, divided by mu squared minus omega k squared, All right? And a couple of our friends are in this equation, right? So you remember that A matrix, the real mathy thing that I kind of forced myself to put on the board a while ago? And I said that the, uh, the normal modes came from the diagonalization of that A matrix. Here they are again. This is the normal mode amplitude, normal mode k, I on I, what's its oscillation amplitude? Normal mode K, ion J, what's its oscillation amplitude? And in that normal mode, what's the oscillation frequency? Okay, so again, we started with that AIJ matrix. All of these things are calculable, and here they are showing up in this effective Ising interaction between ions that kind of logically it's driven by the Rabi frequency. If you throw more laser power at it, then you get more of an interaction. But then also this interaction pattern that you get between ions, ion J, really inherit this normal mode coupling, whenever you have these normal modes that you're exciting, what are the amplitudes of I and K uh, in, of I and J in that oscillation? All right, so if you wanna know what this Ising Hamiltonian looks like, you start from scratch, just like we've done. You work all your way through to calculating what the normal modes look like. And then it is indeed those normal modes which allow you to couple all of these ions together and generate these kind of well-known all-to-all -all interactions um, that you can get between trapped ion systems. All right. So I think we've come a pretty far way already in this first lecture, saying that you know we have started with just classical cold things. We've figured out how to trap them. We've figured out what their equilibrium positions are and, and what their oscillation frequencies look like. And by putting on just a laser beam with two colors, we've now learned that all of those you know that classical stuff that determines oscillation frequencies and amplitudes has now come back to inform us about how these ions are effectively coupling the two level qubit systems that are encoded inside. All right, so the entire topic of the next lecture is to say, once we have this JIJ as a starting point, what can we do with it, right? Now, here's how we've done. All right, so let me stop there and then have to take questions. Um, thank you for the lecture. And uh, I have a question that's not really directly related to, to, to the physics over here, but um, there were a uh, breakthrough in the quantum algorithm last year talking about uh, the spring and the balls of the classical system. The, the, the classical algorithm can actually be exponentially speed up by a quantum algorithm. Does that mean we, we need a quantum computer to design this chip ion quantum computer? <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I'd say everything that we, that I've talked about here is, is classical. And, you know, I've only tried, obviously, to a few hundred ions or so, but, you know, for a few hundred ions, everything here is still uh, well within the reach of a laptop or, or that sort of thing. Um, you know, kind of taking the, taking these calculations and figuring out what are the JIJs, what are these normal modes, um, that's a pretty straightforward calculation to do. Yeah, so we, uh, we luck out. So, so if we have millions of uh, trapped ions, and yeah. then <laughs> we might need a not bigger quantum computer to design. I don't usually wish for problems in my life, but that would be one that I'd wish for. <laughs> um, in the expression of JIJ, mm -hmm. It seems that in the limiting, which you pick the detuning to coincide with one of the frequencies, that you could make this interaction on a very large, no? That's true. So one of the things that you could hide a truck behind these like squiggly lines here, um, this is, you know, the way that I've written it, this is, is something that approximation becomes more and more true when this frequency is detuned in the far detuned limit from these normal modes. If you are laying right on top of the normal mode, effectively what you're doing is you are just pumping energy into it forever. And then that normal mode is heating up and heating up and heating up. And in the end, you end up with this kind of massive amount of information just all in the motion uh, and your system looks totally non-coherent. And so really, if we want to kind of dive into the details of what does it take for a good 
high fidelity quantum simulation to go? Um, there's kind of two answers to that. One answer is to say, we virtually excite the phonons. We virtually excite the normal modes. Um, and, and really it's a fancy way of saying, we are so far detuned that at the end of, of applying this ion laser interaction, the amount of information that's kind of left in this residual phonon motion is tiny. And so the errors that accumulate from having that extra phonon motion uh, are small compared to the level of detail you're interested in. That's one way to do it. People who are more interested in gates as opposed to doing quantum simulation experiments, they like to take a different view, which is to say, I want my gates to go fast. And if you want your gates to go fast, absolutely. You want a higher interaction, which means that you have to bring your laser frequency in to be really close to a mode. The catch is that if you don't stop your gate at a very particular time, then you end up in some you know, weird part of the oscillation of this mode. And again, you have lots of motion. And so the catch with gates doing it this way is you can get a bigger interaction by bringing this frequency in closer, but you have to stop that interaction at a very particular time, kind of when the oscillation, you've started it, you have lots of motion, lots of motion. You know, if you stop it right there, then temporarily you don't have motion. Anymore. So you get to get your timing really accurate, in which case then you could benefit from the strong interaction.